one of the things that reassured skeptics about the whole idea of a stronger federal government was that George Washington would be the first president. They knew that Washington would not try to become king because he had already walked away from that possibility uh, at the end of the revolution. And so it was that genius for renouncing power that ironically ensured Washington would be the first president. The first presidential election took place on February 4th, 1789. 69 electors met in their respective states and cast two ballots. The winner would be president and the runner-up vice president. Washington swept the first ballot with all 69 votes. The winner of the second ballot, John Adams, became vice president. When Washington was elected president, people didn't know what to call him. His title wasn't a frivolous issue. It was symbolic of the debate during the convention of how much power to vest in the presidency. John Adams wanted it to be almost real. His Majesty the President. Washington settled on a more modest title, His Excellency the President. Part of being His Excellency is that you don't have to shake hands. They would bow to each other. But part of this is because George Washington didn't like to shake hands with everyone. It's not that he had a phobia about being touched. It's that there was a certain dignity, he thinks, that went with the presidency. Whatever Washington did, nearly every action and decision took on special significance simply because it was the first. Virtually every day of his presidency, Washington faced should a president accept private dinner invitations? Should a president attend funerals? No one knew what a president was. And so Washington very deliberately sought the advice of people around him. He, not surprisingly, thought he needed advisors. So he created this cabinet, but it was the group of people who were responsible to devise policy, to execute policy, to become his closest advisors. The Constitution talks about executive officers. So the idea that there would be people in charge of the great departments of government wasn't a shock. The interesting part is that Washington ultimately decides to convene his executive officers and to meet with them. Over time, the cabinet has grown from four members to 15 but its function has remained largely the same. Washington brought the brightest minds of America together as his advisors, as a cabinet. He invented that. He could have chosen yes men. He could have chosen people who go, yes, whatever you want. But no, he brought together people who were brilliant in theory and brilliant in practice. Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State. For Treasury Secretary, he picks Alexander Hamilton. Then for Secretary of War, he picks Henry Knox, who was one of his generals in the Revolution. And whenever he has a, a decision to make, a policy decision or a decision about how he should do something, he consults all of them. 